question, I would ask, really, really ask you to ask a question. This is not the place to make speeches, but I will allow you 15 to 20 seconds before your question to editorialize or to set up your question. And then it's not a back and forth discussion, one person with the panelists, it's the whole, it's the whole group. Um, it's important we be civil, and these people are panelists, so don't beat up on any of them. They're just giving us information, right? Nobody wants to beat up? No? Okay. All right, good. If they want to fight, we'll give them a fight. If they don't want to fight tonight, so let's not do that. So let's start with transportation. So being able to get around on foot, on a bike, on a bus, in a wheelchair, or scooter, these transportation choices are fundamental to human health and the health of our planet. If I speak too fast, just go like this, and I will slow down, I promise. I do tend to speak fast. In the 2015 municipal election, the Green community asked for dedicated annual funding for cycling and pedestrian infrastructure in the municipal budget. We now have $800,000 per year dedicated to cycling infrastructure and an active transportation coordinator. We asked for policies to complete streets, streets for everyone, whatever their age, abilities, or mode of transportation and transportation demand management, moving people, not just cars, uh, most efficiently. The transportation master plan is expected to commit to completing the complete streets policy and a transportation demand management plan within five years. And you'll notice the five years comes up a lot in this. We asked for better transit and we have, been, we have seen some improvements and a commitment to a transit master plan. Council's strategic plan prioritizes providing quality multimodal transportation alternatives to connect neighborhoods and communities. Planning strategic plan talks about land use, planning and pilot projects that support active transportation, public transit, and active neighborhoods. There are still lots to do, there's still lots to do to become a walkable, bikeable, busable community. Matt Alexander, our first uh, presenter, is a local advocate on sustainable transportation and pedestrian safety and our first panelist is also a good guy. Let's see what he has to say, where we want to be, and how we can get there when it comes to transportation. Matt, it's all yours. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, let's, oh, there we go. Now it's on, isn't it? Yes, it is. Uh, so if you can't hear me, raise your hand up, and I'll just make sure that I speak up more. Okay. <laughs> Keep the mic on. <laughs> Great. Get closer to the microphone if you can. I'll match up, I'll get closer to you. Yeah, sort of thing. Yeah. Better. All right. Try that. So in, in preparation for this, I sent emails to every city councilor and I asked them to tell me what they felt their transportation successes were in the first term, uh, well, in this term of council. And I got a, a very uh, one-sided kind of impression. I think they knew their audience here. Um, they talked about transit, they talked about cycling, they talked about pedestrians. The only person who mentioned Maley Drive was the mayor, uh, or the mayor's office, and that was in the context of providing for tunnels to provide uh, connecting links to trails with the Maley extension. For the turtles? Well, for, for everybody, I think. Okay. Yeah, including turtles and wolves and coyotes or whatever. Um, now, one of the things that Jerry didn't mention as far as successes that was mentioned by, by councillors was uh, $50,000 in transit wayfinding is supposedly coming forward uh, during the Commuter Challenge Week, which is uh, soon. June 5th. June 5th. Um, that's a surprise to me because I hadn't heard anything about that, and I hadn't heard any public consultation on that, and I think maybe we'll be talking about public engagement, citizen engagement tonight. Um, so that was a bit of a surprise to me. Uh, another councillor mentioned that the city is working on forming a new transit board and hiring a, quote, top-notch transit director. Also kind of news, but not that surprising considering what happened recently. Uh, with uh, going forward on, on transportation issues, you know, we have, we have the transportation master plan that's going to be finalized any time now um, in the next couple of months, I'm sure. There's going to be an opportunity to comment on that. Uh, it's done through the environmental assessment process, and you should be able to review the final piece uh, before it uh, is, is approved. Uh, so I sort of urge you, urge everybody to, to take a, a close look at that again and submit comments, because the strategic plan, the corporate strategic plan, does include a lot of direction 
on transportation. It talks about sustainable infrastructure. It talks about quality of life. And our public streets are uh, usually take up about 80% of all the public space in a municipality. So the quality of those streets and the way that those streets are used really goes a long way to improving quality of life. But only if it actually does. Uh, one of the things that was asked for was complete streets policies. And the draft transportation master plan definitely talks about it being a complete streets plan. But whether it actually includes policies that implement that vision is a, a question that remains to be answered, I think. Um, other things that I think we've, we've seen come forward are uh, bike lanes are, are going, going to happen on 2nd Avenue. Uh, if Second Avenue ever happens. Um, Councillors have been talking about working with staff to put bike lanes on Paris Street as well. Once again, not so much in the public realm. We haven't heard a lot of discussion about it in the media or at council meetings, but uh, apparently those are discussions that are going on. So I think there's a lot to be optimistic about. The key thing is to be uh, continue with some pressure on your local councillors. Every time you see them, you say, hey, where's that active transportation coordinator? At this point, you know, everybody's saying that they'll start sometime in the summer. Uh, that might be a little too late to do a lot of the consultation and engagement that a new active transportation coordinator should be doing, but it's, it's progress and it's something I think we can be optimistic about. I don't know where I am on time. Okay, don't worry. Two minutes left. Two minutes? I'll give you, I'll give you the one minute signal. Yeah, I had a feeling. Um, but yeah, so we've got $800,000 earmarked every year for active transportation. So that's cycling and pedestrian infrastructure. Uh, but we're here in the second year of that budget item, and uh, we're not sure exactly how it's been spent uh, or where it's been spent. It hasn't been spent. It hasn't been spent. Yeah, no, I knew that. Um, <laughs> but there are, there are things that are being promoted. So they're talking about edge lines on Moonlight Drive. Is that active transportation uh, uh, infrastructure? Again, that's sort of open for debate. Some people wouldn't say that it is. Uh, we're talking about Second Avenue. Are the are the bike lanes that are going to be implemented in that? Is that going to take away from that budget? Part of a bigger discussion that we need to have, and I, I hope that in the next few years, and maybe through forums like this, we sort of put the pressure on council to have those discussions in public, and not so much just one-on-one -on -one where maybe the, the reach of those comments don't go so far. So those are my thoughts on, on transportation. For me, uh, from my perspective, a good transportation system is safe, efficient, and affordable. And that's the sort of thing that you can always improve on. And we should be always pushing for that kind of improvement. And I think that, uh, yeah, that just about wraps it up. Thank you. Yay. So local food is healthy and adds to our food security. In the 2015 municipal election, the Green Community asked for a food action plan supporting rural and urban agriculture and local food procurement by city institutions. Council's strategic plan does not reference local food. However, planning strategic plan commits to a food strategy in the next five years that will focus on food production, processing, marketing, distribu distribution, and disposal. Our next panelist is Eric Thaimeiser, and he's a member of the Greater Sudbury Food Policy Council, amongst other things, and he will speak to moving forward when it comes to local food and agriculture. Eric. Right, thanks, Jerry. Yeah, I am a resource person for the local uh, the Greater Sudbury Food Policy Council, which meets once a month at City Hall. Is this not on? Closer to the mic, maybe. Or just be closer? No, that's better. So yeah, act as a resource to the Greater Sudbury Food Policy Council and uh, work a lot with the Eat Local Sudbury and with groups across the north in my job as the Agri-Food Sector Lead for FedNor, which is a community development funder uh, based with its head office here, but with offices across the north and uh, federal government programs. So uh, I also uh, act as a volunteer president of the Sun Cooperative, the local uh, solar nonprofit solar cooperative, which is trying to build some renewable energy projects in Sudbury. And both of those, I bring that up because both of those are about localization of 
uh, something, things that we are fundamental to our lives, energy and food. And that's what I, why I'm passionate about those things, because of all the benefits of, of localizing and making those more sustainable. Things we spend a big chunk of our money on every day. Uh, and so in terms of where do we want to get to as a community, the vision has been since 2004, the Food Charter, which is adopted by the city. For those that don't know, it is a vision uh, and it talks about all residents having access to adequate, safe, affordable, nutritious, culturally acceptable food. And the food system itself, which we think of as everything from the farmers to the producer, uh, the processors, distributors, and consumers, and the social and environmental stakeholders, everybody involved in the food system. Uh, and the, the food charter talks about that being financially viable and prosperous and fair and environmentally sustainable and all these things. And the food charter also mentions about having citizens be knowledgeable about it, about the food system. So that's the big vision of that I would base uh, the question of where we want to get to as a community. Um, I thought I should mention also the official plan has a vision for local food systems. And I think it's important to distinguish between local food, which is something produced locally uh, and consumed locally as opposed to the food system which where there might be a lot of concerns social and uh, equity concerns poverty and it's just a you just want to get healthy food to people affordably and so it's not necessarily local food always involved uh, so there's a, there's a, food is such a big topic and it's some, somewhat new to the environmental community I, I think in the last uh, in 10 years maybe uh, and so I feel like I need to give a little more background but so the official plan talks about local food and growing the local food system. It talks about having a local food action plan, as was mentioned. Uh, it talks about preserving the agricultural land. We have an agricultural reserve that runs from Chelmsford to uh, Valterez in the valley there. Uh, and it talks about supporting new farmers, talked about food processing, and it talks about uh, all residents having access to local food in their neighborhoods, which is interesting. Two minutes already. Oh, well. Uh, so, why do we want to get there? I think we know all the benefits in terms of healthy food every day to every aspect of our lives. Uh, there's economic benefits to local food, of course. The Siberians spend half a billion dollars on food every year. And so, shifting that to local food would be would cause a huge uh, economic impact. And of course, social health, environmental benefits of sustainably produced food. Uh, we have 141 farms in the community. And that's staying stable. There's some new success stories uh, on new farmers, but otherwise, farmers are some new farmers are somewhat of an endangered species. But so, how do we get to having a more uh, that food system vision that we have? Uh, agriculture doesn't always get a lot of attention in Sudbury because it's smaller, much smaller relative to to other sectors. Though there's thousands of jobs if you include all the restaurants and. Uh, Grocery stores and that, but uh, so it's not an, it's not a priority in the official in the economic development plan. It's not a priority in council's plan, but it is a big part of the official plan, of course, because it takes up a lot of land, and um, there's a lot in there about preserving farmland and about avoiding conflict with neighbors um, in terms of land use. And what's interesting is over the last few years there. For those that remember, ten years ago, was a big debate about topsoil, and and when the and that was when the agriculture preserve was created. And since that, there's been a bit of a disconnect between the city and, and farmers in the community. And uh, there was an advisory committee to the city at one point for for farmers. And uh, the Great Sudbury Food Policy Council is trying to fill that gap and bring a communication back between farmers and, and the city. Um, and so we're working on that. And so that's an important uh, way to get to a better food system. Um, certainly we need to raise awareness, awareness. And I guess the biggest thing that was mentioned in the plans that we have right now is that food strategy. So you're going to see that over the next year. Um, the city and the Food Policy Council and the Social Planning Council and the Health Unit and are all working right now on a community, community engagement plan for that strategy. So how are we going to get the input from the community and try to be really creative, innovative, and engage populations that aren't always able to uh, input into these plans. So you're going to see that over the next year. And that's really important in terms of raising awareness of food and how important it is to the environment and to our health and all of these things. Um, 
and I guess some, there's a, there's certainly some good things in the, in the plan, as I've mentioned, a lot of a lot of uh, the official plan in terms of recognizing the importance of food and agriculture and local food. Uh, they're going to do an inventory of all of our assets in the community in terms of uh, people's access to food, healthy food in their neighborhoods, uh, and, and local production of food, and and they're making sure that uh, city land is accessible for things like community gardens and urban agriculture. There's lots of projects like that going on. They're just uh, expanding community gardens uh, all over the place. And I guess the one concern with the official plan that you might have heard, a couple of years ago there was a big meeting uh, of the planning committee where they were discussing severances of lots in the rural areas of the city. Um, and they, they, based on some people that were wanting to sever their lots and sell parts of them, uh, even though they were good farmland, uh, the city allowed lowered the limit. So you can now sever lots. You can have six lots uh, instead of four lots, and you can make them two acres instead of five acres. So it's it's just splitting up uh, farmland that isn't part of the agricultural reserve. Uh, but splitting up farmland more and more, and, and other there's other issues with that in terms of urban planning, but. That's the one thing in the in the official plan that maybe could cause some issues. Thank you, Eric. Okay.